Okay, we are back. <laughs> On behalf of the 92nd Street Y and the wonderful Paris theater that Netflix has brought us back to, please welcome Alejandro Iñárritu. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Thank okay. you for that welcome, wow. <laughs> Don't be surprised, um, and some people I happen to know in this audience have seen the film before. It's their second viewing at the very least, and um, I saw it twice too, as I mentioned beforehand. Uh, once again, I'm Annette Insdorf, and I teach film at Columbia University, and one of the reasons I love to teach film is so that I can turn students on, and anyone else, to films that strike me as a cut above what movies generally do, namely that they start to make you think differently and dream differently. So I want to start off by asking you a question really about the opening sequence. As you know, my, my most recent book is called Cinematic Overtures, How to Read Opening Scenes, because I'm convinced that any great film tells you within the first two minutes how to watch the rest of the movie. So was that ascending silhouette, <laughs> was that always going to be the opening of Bardo? Yes, absolutely. Um, it was always that way. This is a recurrent uh, dream that I have, and it comes by periods. So only when I start dreaming it, it it's like w several times that I dream something like that, three, four times in the month, for example, and then disappeared, and I miss it, you know? But the dream, in a way, has like two things. One is liberating, and normally it's a lucid dream, which meaning that I was I'm aware that I dream. But it's so the sensation is so nice, but at the same time, it's dangerous because I know always that the, the fly happens, and I I'm, I'm sure that many people here has has that sensation. It's always very close to the ground. So I know that anything that I do, I can just kill myself, even when I'm a shadow. <laughs> so, or I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in material. So yes, uh, in a way for me, it came not as a thought or something rational. I said, this is a nice dream. And, and it's funny how now I can see, w I don't understand why, but now when I hear people interpreting that, it, it makes sense without me having thinking about it. You know? Well, that's one of the great things that movies can do. The visuals don't have to make logical sense. They can make dream sense because we're put into a state of a kind of hypnosis if we give ourselves over to a movie. But was this the first image? I mean, in other words, what were some of the earliest images, whether they came to you in dreams or in your waking imagination? Because I'm guessing this film didn't start as a script with dialogue or a lot of words, but more with images. Um, what are some of the other ones? Well, um, I will say that uh, I have uh, my, my father passed away uh, um, eight years ago, and again, I dream with him incredibly often. And uh, I have a very nice relation with my dad, but I think there's things that I never said, or I will have loved him to say, uh, and I have a dream always that he dressed with this stripes shirt that he never wore. Was, he was a very traditional, but I don't know why he's always with stripes. I don't know if he's in jail or something. <laughs> and, and I hug him. He was a kind of a big man with these big hands. And it's so uh, um, real that I have wake up a couple of times swearing that it happened. I mean, it's so, mm, so sensorial that I swear that I smell him, that it, it's so real. But it's, uh, again, another very often kind of thing with different emotions. Sometimes it's very intense, sometimes it's super sad, sometimes it's just calming, you know, which I think that's what um, I wanted to show these images because sometimes those images of people that we have lost create us. Another one was, uh, the corridor in the hospital uh, the, the after the fly. Because for me, that was like, you know, my wife and I, um, my wife is here someplace. And, uh, and uh, you know, we have a very 
uh, traumatic event. We, we, we lost uh, uh, our second son that died with some lung disease. And, and 11 months later, after uh, Luciano was his name, passed away, we have a star, our uh, son, El Eliseo, that in the moment that he born in this kind of labor room, uh, he got, uh, he bought with this, uh, he born with the same disease. So he was super delicate. So he, he was taken di directly to the intense care for one month, connected with a tooth. He has to be two for one month. And he was about to die every day. So it was extremely traumatic thing that we were dealing in that same corridor that we have our first daughter. It was the most happy moment in our life. Then months later, this tragic event, and then 11 months later, we were dealing with one that it was really struggling. And that corridor, I remember the nights I, we spent a month there. So that corridor became kind of this passage of something that some, when you are young and something like that happened, it, it really is a traumatic event because it changed and make you feel how life can just disappear in one second. Something that is so unnatural and unexpected. And uh, anyway, hopefully, uh, thankfully, uh, Lisa, our son, got better, and we took him home, and it was a lot of care, and he's great now, he's 25 years. But that, that feeling hang, you know, as, as, as Silverio said, people pass away, and we lost people that we care and we love, but it's the ideas that stay. You know, the people go, but the ideas of that people can can heal you or can hurt you or can, you know, it's wounds, it's an emotional wound. So that's why that image in a way was for me very important because it's like like a umbilical cord, you know, and then, in, and then the boss, which is another time, he's sitting in the boss and it's this lineal kind of thing of things that are happening. <laughs> Life is passing while we are just sitting and happen what it has to happen. But it also relates for me to what makes you a great filmmaker as opposed to a great memoirist, somebody who could take a tragic event from life and put it into a drama. A, you turn it into a comic, at times darkly comic thing. Matteo doesn't want to stay in this world, he's gonna go back into the womb, which you know reminded me of that wonderful, um, in the tin drum, the way Volker Schlundorf's film opens, little Oscar is born, and his voiceover says that he takes one look at the adult world outside and decides right back into the womb he's gonna go, and it's his voiceover. It, 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 you transform it into something that almost borders on a kind of fantastic or circus quality. The umbilical cord has to be cut by scissors. And I, I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned the importance of this corridor, you, uh, Darius Konji shot this in glorious 65 millimeter, if I understand. And, yeah. and it's your first film that you shot on film stock since Beautiful in 2010? No, this was shot in, in 65 digital. We start shooting in, 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 in film, and in Mexico there was no laboratory, and we had to, tr uh, the f it was, the, sec uh, the film was stopped the first time because of the pandemic, then we, six months we were, uh, and then we start pre-production, we start shooting in 65 film, and we had to carry and send all the material by plane uh, at night, and then four days later come back and has to go with the ex uh, airports and x-ray and the cost of this material being sent by plane and returned, it was so crazy that this Mexican film couldn't handle. So it was heartbreaking for me to, to and I couldn't, and then we stopped because the second time because the pandemic hit us, and then the third time Darius and I decided that it was 65 digital and we're very happy, and this is uh, a 35. Uh, print of that. So, it's not just the corridor shot. Later in the film, I remember um, he's walking in the street the, the, into depth. You, it's like the camera, you, you and um, Darius have the camera exploring space at the same time that you're telling the story. So that if it begins with a vertical ascent and then coming down again, and then you have the lateral shots throughout the film, but you've always got this movement into depth and you use all these wide angle shots and long takes. So I'm, I'm veering away now from your personal and dream world into how did you and he decide on these visual strategies? Were you aware that you were going to be, for example, 
exploring the entire sort of geographical realm at the same time that you were going to tell so very story. Yes, I think that, you know, uh, the, the big challenge for me, there was two things. One that you mentioned already, like how something so intimate and traumatic can be explored different. I think that, I think art exists because life is not perfect and sometimes sucks. And that's why we love books and poetry and films and music because that, that's, that's the way it can be healed. The, the, that's the way to heal a wound by reinterpreting and, and, and giving it through the emotional idea another interpretation to, to heal, to overcome a trauma. And that's, I think, the best way I could come with that, the way I liberate that idea through the sea, through this kind of metaphor that I wanted to, that is, and it, it has been actually very cathartic in that sense. So, and the tone of it, after so many years, I now can see that I'm sure I will have never been able to do this 10 years ago. I was not ready, I, it was too close. But now I can see it with some perspective and even with some sweetness and, and accepting surrender and even smile about it because there was something that happened by a reason. I'm not God, <laughs> thankfully. So in a way, it's just to accept that and laugh about it. Even, even laugh about it can be healing. So that's the tone of the movie I wanted to approach the whole movie uh, with humor because I think humor is the only way that you can fight nostalgic and melancholy and all that, th those are traps that you can get very, uh, or drama. So humor was very important and I want to establish that since the first moment. And then the lenses and the way I want to shoot it is like, always the challenge was if this will come from the last two, three minutes of a human life where all memories and images and everything is just as they said, when we are dying all our life in a way, you, we will just, our brain start kind of curating what really is priority and important and your affections and your things. Then I was trying to see how I dream, how I can make people to feel like a walk in the, in, in the, uh, on the subconscious, more than a dream, it's a walk in the subconscious mind which is different, and I didn't want this to be crazy or hallucinatory, but always as we dream, it's, it's real. But there's something off, you know, some details. So, but the atmosphere of a dream, I was always very challenging to say how a dream looks like or how you flesh out something so elusive as a dream. And I felt that the atmosphere of this this is slow movements that is a constant movement, as you say, kind of going through the spaces, is the way the dreams flow as music and as life that is in constant move. That was my interpretation, but I want that as music that is creating different emotions with blending and me enmeshing things with no cuts or structure or act. Act one, act two, act three, plot 25. Oh my God, so, I mean, I didn't want that. So it just was like an enmesh mess of, 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 of involuntary memory flashes, you know? That, that's what I want. But the way it plays is the opposite of a mess. There is chaos in Silverio's mental landscape, let's say. I'm assuming that most of the film unfolds in that bardo between when he's in a coma, let's say. Mm -hmm. That's how I was exactly. relating to the film. And the fluidity of the camera work, the way that you use music as a sound bridge. There are so many times in the film where I realized I'm floating, kind of like the opening shot. The film makes you float as opposed to having cut, cut, you know, montage that would be much harsher as a way of existing inside a movie for the characters and for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I, I'm so glad that you are talking and you, you know, it's, it's so, it's so, um, it's so energizing to talk about cinema as you talk because you know exactly the, the real thing is that, the language, the grammatic language that I was trying to explore with this phantasmagorical, I, I love what you said, mental landscape, that's exactly right. And the way you approach it, the, the form is substance. 
And the way Darius and I and Eugenio Caballero and Ana Terrazas and all the teams we approach it, we were really careful and worked really hard for years preparing all these with incredible control. I have never had a film that demand of me and require of me not only a big introspection, but externally and technically, I could have not made this film before in my life. I think I require, I think you need like 20 years at least to start understanding some things. And I think I can understand a little bit what this film was required, which was absolutely kind of, um, how can I say it, precision in every, you will not believe, but that corridor in the first uh, shot, we change it three times because we built it with some colors, with some textures, and something was wrong. The pandemic hit, thankfully. In the second time, we changed colors, and there was something that was not right. And it was so crucial to get those two minutes that you said. It's true. It's like when you listen to an album, right? You, you, you put in the music, and you know wh where, you, where you are, or you drink a wine. You don't need to eat the, drink the bottle. You, you know that it's good or bad. Or, you know. So those minutes were so important and then finally you know we discover oh my god yes the backlight the sun is there for getting that dream and then the floor that it was shiny projecting the thing it was like a double reality that you see two realities the one projected here and then we end up doing the walls with the stucco with this kind of bone color that is not white but before th the floor was blue was a cheap kind of hospital with the, the curtains had a color green. So there was something, and it took us three times to rebuild it, to the, the finishes, to get that and see, and we said, oh, now, now that's a dream. You know, but, but me, the kitchen, we changed three, four times the floor of the kitchen because the kitchen floor was informing different. So what I'm saying, it, it was from the material and the palette of every element to the staging of every step of the actor and every camera move from the dance floor to the most, uh, this scene that will, nobody will understand how difficult it was because nobody should, but the moment that he arrived to his home and he see outside the street and then Lucia turns the lights and then he sit down and then he start doing the monologue about you know success and that he's always looking appreciation. The camera goes down, then we go to a close up and then he goes out, she goes out, and then the camera goes back, and now uh, we are in a super extreme close-up. You cannot imagine the circus behind that shot that nobody should have. <laughs> but Daniel was going into the thing, and the guy was cough. <laughs> and then you see, oh, this is a very quiet thing, but we were like shouting before, you know. So it, <laughs> it required a madness before that little soft kind of movement, a nightmare. So er, all the film was like that, you know, to design that precise little softness that you talk, you know? Uh, I mean, part of the irony for me is that the central character is presumably a documentary filmmaker, mm -hmm. the kind of person who captures reality as opposed to letting his imagination run free. And of course, you have the, some wonderful little asides in the film, like Luis saying to him, oh, cabron, I saw your film, and wow, you're, you're smoking a cigarette with Cortez on top of a mountain, wow, and then he attacks him. In other words, you're, you're dangling before us the possibility that the film we're watching, Bardo, is the film that Silverio was either making or dreaming of making. And I'm just wondering, is, is that part of your idea? Absolutely, absolutely. For me, it was a meta-exploration of, of going to observe that sometimes your intentions, you, the, the worst enemy of myself is myself. And, and in a way, you know, I did this, uh, I have been talking about migration for, in three films, in Babel I did it, in Beautiful I did it, I did Carne Arena, a virtual reality project with, with 500 very, very in people in the margins that has crossed the border in incredible difficult situations and I was very touched by this. I think that that installation had a huge impact and I think it was the beginning of the trigger of this. But in a way, sometimes when you got into these realities, um, sometimes you're question what, what else you can do if you are, what is your role, I, you know? And I think Silverio is in a crisis to start questioning himself, uh, the meaning of his job, 
the meaning of the truth. What, what is the truth? What is to be a journalist? If the truth exists or always will be impregnated by subjectivity and, and your own system of beliefs and depending on where you come from and what is your values and what you have breakfast in the morning, you will write differently uh, from other people. So he's questioning the nature of his job as a journalist and that's why he's trying to find true fiction a way to do it. So in a meta way, I was questioning myself about my own interactions with sometimes that reality that I have been researching in different films, look, uh, that I have done a kind of a journalistic work, and then I do the, the fictionalize that. And at the same time, I was playing with this idea that he had himself, he has started not to, he, as he said, I'm tired of reality. I am, I, I, I'm trying to say what I think and not what I feel. So by doing this kind of absurd vignettes of him talking with Cortez or he was in a way questioning, and I truly believe that as this material, this film comes from a very deep personal things, and that's why it's called False Chronicle of a Handful of Truth. That means it's fiction. I fictionalize, and I think that fiction, as Silverio did here, or trying to do with this ridiculous vignettes, or the battle in Chapultepec, that the guy laughed about him, he said, oh, you're ridiculous things with the wig and all that thing that he's criticizing the film, my film, the film of uh, the, and I'm criticizing myself about how stupid and absurd and pretentious and self-indulgent and narcissistic, <laughs> all the things that they have been saying about me outside, I wrote it first, I know it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's what I mean. And, and that's, that's that, that, that I can be harsh. So what I'm saying is that I was just putting a mirror in the mirror of this way we think of ourselves sometimes and you can see it and and I love that idea that that in the light of cynicism or 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 or, or irony you can destroy everything that you do or for any person job you can act like that you can you can destroy anything it's very easy to destroy so anyway yes it's it's that character representing a way for me a kind of a, like a nemesis of himself talking to himself and the two worlds that we are approaching. I want this film, in that sense, I think that fiction in a way reveals what reality hides, and fiction in a way helps to get to higher truth. And that's what Silverio is trying, and the other guy is so mad about him, because he's getting out of the cage of rightfulness and truthful and chronological thing, and all these people that is very rational that they fight with anything that they don't understand, which is everything mostly, you know? It's, it's Picasso's great line, um, art is the lie that reveals the truth. Uh, you know, and when, when Silverio at one point says, I think to Luis, it's a docu-fiction. I go, what, what? <laughs> because you know, it's playing with two supposedly unconnected concepts, but what you're describing, especially because so much of this film emerges from your personal history experiences and from something that is completely fabricated, illusory, and very powerful emotionally. I'm even thinking, I, one of my favorite scenes in the film is the bathroom where Silverio finds his father. And I love how you shrunk the body of Silverio with his adult head. That right away, just whoosh, wow. Um, but the father says, I even jotted it down because I want to make sure I don't say it right. It's about success. And uh, yeah, yeah. The great advice about success is you have to sip it swirl it in your mouth without swallowing, and spit it out, or it will poison you, unquote. And so given your extraordinary success, you've had like five Oscars, including back-to-back -back with Birdman and The Revenant. You know, is this also some aspect of your own that you are transforming into a kind of surreal scene? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, there's two aspects. I think it's very hard in Mexico. I was raised by a uh, uh, Catholic. And differently from the uh, uh, um, uh, evangelical tradition or the Protestant tradition that normally success or money is a sign of God, you know, benefiting you and you're proud about it. In, in the Catholic tradition and in Mexico, in a conservative kind of environment, money, success, it's a little bit contradictory because it can create in you temptations to be a sinner 
to be proud, to be pride, the pride and la soberbia. You know, I don't know how soberbia is said. I don't know if somebody knows how soberbia is said. It's pride, I think. So all those things. Maybe even hubris. See, yeah. So there's something that it, there's almost like, a, somos culpígenos. There's almost like a guilty feeling of owning things because in the Catholic tradition, the last one is the first and to be poor is the biggest beer too. So there's something about that, that I was educated like that, that, that I do not deserve. And if you got it, you have to be careful. So it was a contradictory always like, okay, I got it, but then I, and then obviously the fear of losing it. And we all desire it, but then we all look kind of, I are afraid to lose something that we have get. And then when somebody impregnate the guilt of having it, because maybe you are, you could be a sinner or you don't deserve it. I, I, rise, I, ra I was raised with these kind of feelings. And my father actually had a very diff you know, complicated relation with success because in a way he, he never praised anybody because he was afraid that somebody, if he said something good about somebody, that somebody will believe in it and then will stop doing what he was doing so right unconsciously. So my father really, I think he didn't do it not because he was a bad person. He didn't want me to spoil me you know, to, to make me feel that I was whatever. But it ha was part of the Catholicism, part of his own philosophy, you know, and, and those things always was complicated for me to understand were that, uh, that recognition of our fathers. They said that the only thing that we are looking in our lives is to be loved, obviously, and the recognition of your father. And if you have that fracture in a way not solved, it, it creates a complication. Anyway, I'm not hurt. I love my dad and it was amazing man. But that part was kind of twisted in, in him, and, 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 and he said that line especially, always. He always was so mad about people that were successful and a little bit arrogant. Like, I remember when there was Hugo Sanchez, a great player, and he said, look at how uh, uh, successful people start talking in third person, which is true. So Hugo Sanchez was, <laughs> was always saying, well, it's, it's good. Hugo saying, and, and he, my father said, you are Hugo, you asshole, you are Hugo. How you said Hugo, you are Hugo. You know, so these people that talk in third person as if they were characters created by themselves, so that's a little cuckoo. <laughs> so my father hated that guy, I make me laugh a lot, so I always laugh with him about him, but in a way he was always, so he told me that line many times, which is true, by the way, and I took it very seriously. And I have been suspicious of success, and I think failure and success, both are impostors, both. Both, because they will never make your work better. Or, I mean, this film will be good with praises or with criticism. It, the film is a film. It's not what it says about that film. And anyway, I have been always that. But yes, I wanted to talk about how absurd and stupid can be that success can be a failure too. You know, and um, and and I think I think when you realize that success will never fix your insecurities, your internal needs, if you don't work in that, exterior goals will never find you at peace. Mm -hmm. And I think whoever that has got any success, you don't have to win an Oscar, you can get any success that you planned yourself, you realize that it's so elusive, doesn't change your life. No, I, that, that, that's how I feel. And that's what Silverius asked a question and the, what that success has demand on him and what he has been given to get that and what he has been left out. That's, that's the question that we, that I, I have in myself, you know. The father also has this wonderful line, depression is a bourgeois disease. <laughs> <laughs> that's another line of my father, by the way. I had a feeling. That <laughs> <laughs> now, I, unfortunately, we, we can't have a very long Q&A, and I've been told that we only have a few minutes for audience questions, and I have a funny feeling that there are a lot of questions in this audience. If we can raise the lights just a little bit, I want to give an opportunity, and I see already hands are going up on my... Um, is there a, a microphone that can be brought? Yeah, I see hands right over there, and then I see one right in the middle here but we may not get to all of you, for which I apologize in advance. Uh, there are like two people waving very vigorously. Um, so we'll take, <laughs> I know, I know. Now, why didn't I know to do vigorous? All right, um, go ahead. I can't see from here, so I'll just trust that one of you is getting the mic. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Vivian, and I am a student of Professor Insdorf, and um, I am blessed because I am constantly exposed to amazing films, and I am never speechless after watching anything, but um, your film has left me speechless, and it's not you, my 
English barrier, <laughs> um, or language barrier per se, but um, I will never forget the feeling throughout the film or what I experienced, and I think, I, I, I'm sorry, it's just like I'm purely just complimenting you, but I just wanted to say that they will definitely influence me and um, me in pretty much in filmmaking. But my question is about the screenplay. So you mentioned involuntary memory, and the first thing I thought about was Hiroshima Mon Amour, <laughs> and the way how, you know, um, Jean Bra, uh, I mean, the director actually depicts um, the memory right there, and you bring up historical events, and you talk about, you know, your personal um, life, uh, and then, you know, you mix reality with dream and you do it in such a way where it's so organic you do not even know where you're at what's real and what's not and i was just wondering about the process how have you how have you created i, I hope everyone heard a, a question about the process really of screenwriting um because uh she was reminded of hiroshima mon amour because of involuntary memory historical experience and the subjectivity of the character mm. yeah i i think that the, the process was weird. I have never worked in without, with that process. First, the fabric was weird, this elusive material that was kind of coming from a place. It was a lot of introspection and a lot come from the subconscious. You know, I was not trying to make sense of it. Things that I curated acupuncturally, things that I consider. And then how to turn those emotions or images of things in ideas. So what's the idea behind this landscape, between this dream, between this wound that I feel or this thing that is not solved? And then to turn all of these ideas, one of one, each, each, by each, uh, each one, singular, individually, a sequence. So I was interested to create a sequence that not necessarily was connected with the next one. I didn't care about that. So once I have this, 32 sequences, I wanted to be 28, but in a way I ended up doing 32 sequences. They naturally start blending and I was just trying to find the point of stitch. Stitch meaning, that was the most thing, it was like a dune, like to create a sculpture with sand and water that is melting and I want to be soft and that is an invisible, like a concept album of the 70s of, uh, you know, you know, like that you put the needle and it's just going and there is no cuts in songs and and shitty uh, kind of uh, promotional radio things. No, it's, just, it's just a Pink Floyd album that is just telling a story and it's blending things. And that's the way I saw it. So what I'm saying is I develop each sequences and then I put the needle and then I try to find where I can start making the next one. And that was challenging, but that's the way I work it. And, and with no structure, and I really suggest that young screenwriter is a great liberating thing to get out of narrative and storytelling. So, I mean, it was for me so liberating um, that that's not the only way to make cinema, you know? I discovered that, you know? We're gonna take a question here, but I'm going to just add, we haven't had time to talk about the fact that Alejandro also co-wrote the music. He composed the score with Bryce Dessner. <laughs> so, <laughs> your description of process I think comes partly from the fact that you are also a musician. No, I'm, a, I'm not a musician. Or I have a just good ears. I'm a terrible musician, but with I music ideas. That's okay, right. musical ideas. Bryce is the musician. Right there. Um, primero, te lo quiero decir en español. Es ver una película completamente en español. Increíble. My question is your relationship to this country. Um, it, it's very interesting. There's a couple of times, you know, when you talk about the history between Mexico and America. So I'm interested in hearing about how your relationship with this country, making films as a Mexican filmmaker, but that are shown here, how that informs whether you choose to include those history or those little tidbits, where does that come from? I think it's a very, very um, interesting relation that I have because at some point this, 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 the, the relation between Mexico and United States is together for the last 200 years and it's a very complicated love-hate relation. And, you know, we are attaching so many things historically, emotionally, economically, culturally, you know what I mean? So we are there. And at the same time, there's nothing more different than an American and a Mexican. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's incredible the different ways that we see the world, that we live, that we... It's, it's incredible, and how we have been holding this nicely, I would say, the, even the contradictions. 
uh, of, of, of the different nature of all of us. And I think that I w it, it's funny that the film, in a way, navigating time, you know, for me, that joke that I said that Amazon will buy the peninsula of California <laughs> is something that I'm pointing in the future because I will not doubt that Mr. Uh, 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 Jeff Bezos will buy my home tomorrow. You know what I mean? I think he owns everything that we own in our house. So, and it's, it's true, these companies now has much more money than completely like the, 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 that, that, you, that countries itself. So anyway, it's kind of this fear of the future. And then I go in the past and I revise this war of Mexico and the United States, which was a very interesting thing that never is told in the schools here, but it was actually a very brutal thing and it was a war. Not, well, not a war, as he says, an invasion. And, and in our country, ridiculously, these kids were slaughtered. They were 13, 14 year kids that were in this military school. This is a Castillo de Chapultepec that you see there that is in the middle of Chapultepec, which is like three times bigger than ti that, that, that Central Park. It's a beautiful kind of song. This castle was built by the Spanish um, in, in, the, in, in the 17th century. Then, so the Spanish were there for 300 years. Then uh, the French came with Maximiliano, so we have another uh, invasion. And then the Americans came, and that was the last part that they took, and these kids were slaughtered and abandoned. So the story of Mexico actually can be told from that kind of building, but in our country, it was invented this mythology that these kids, you know, that one of them, Juan Escutia, wrapped himself in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the flag, and by not getting the American, you know, this historical thing, and every year the president do this kind of homage, and we all know, and every story I know that is a lie, but we just keep cultivating that lie, and we make from a defeat kind of a victory of honor, and it, so it's hilarious in a way, and it's sad and absurd, and I want to comment, and then obviously, in the, in the present is about this border issue. You know, borders are an illusion. And he's playing as an illusion with him, and obviously he's doing this documentary about immigration and thing. And then I wanted to play with the idea that the maid is not let in into the fancy cloth. And he, in a way, Silverio kind of play a little bit like, okay, well, you know, and the daughter. And then he arrived to the United States, <laughs> And a Mexican descendant guy said, well, you know, you cannot go. And down, now he's like, what, what? You know, and in a way, it's, it's kind of the racism and classicism, not, not only U.S. citizens played with us, but it's us with us by, by, by what I call pig, pigmentocracy, which is, no, la, la pigmentocracia. You know, I'm a dark-skinned guy, but if I will be a little bit more white, it will be treated better in Mexico. Or, you know, it, it's that in Mexico we have these incredible castes. Of, uh, so I wanted to comment about that, and, and sometimes has happened to me that in a paper, and depending on the officer, I have always been living here with one O1 visa for 14 years, and I had a reckless driving in 2003 in Mississippi, <laughs> and for 12, 14 years, every time that I came here, they send it to me to secondary revision, which means one hour in a room with suspicious people, 14 years. And this scene that you say, it's a scene that happened to my wife that is here and will not let me lie. And I, she arrived home three years ago and she was so moved to tears and said, this happened to me. This guy was saying that. And it was a mean guy, right? And, and with no necessarily to you, but in, suddenly your identity is in a paper. So more than anything, I want you to talk how fragile is this relation that is very close, but it can be broken in one second. And my relation with this country has been always, as, as I always said, is always great and thankful and I have been support and that. But all the time, there's things, and especially in the last years, that has been getting a little bit more complicated. <laughs> and I, it's a torn apart kind of sensation. You know, it's very complicated. I know there are more hands, but I've received a signal that tells me that we're not going to be able to take any more. The only way I can rationalize the fact that we've essentially scratched the surface of this film, because we could talk for at least another hour, is I consider this part one of an extended conversation with the great Alejandro Iñárritu, and I am looking forward to having you back at the 92nd Street Y at some point in the near future for part two. And in the meantime, as the Mexican entry for the Best International Feature, I hope we're going to see a lot of 
you on the awards season circuit. And we thank you so much for the experience of this film. Thank you. Thank you very much.